Okay, so that's the front row. How many of y'all glad to be here this morning? Okay, I got the back row. How many of y'all glad to be here this morning? How many of y'all glad to be here this morning? I mean, if you're truly glad to be here this morning, you need to let God know, God, I'm glad to be here this morning. They say, well, Doc, why, why, do, you, why do you say that? Because this morning wasn't promised to you. This time wasn't promised to you. We still live in a time where things are happening. We still live in a time where there are neighborhood shootings and church shootings and school shootings and apartment shootings and house shootings. And so we still live in a time that in spite of all of that, we have a God who is still on the throne. So every time we come to God's house, we need to give God thanks, God, for allowing me to make it here one more time. Because it really wasn't promised that way. Amen. Amen. So I'm not going to be before y'all long, I promise, because if I don't, Pastor ain't going to let me preach no more. But that's okay. As Pastor say, I got the mic right now. No, I'm just <laughs> Amen. Amen. As we're standing, I want to take us back to a familiar passage of Scripture. We're in 2 Corinthians. We're in the fourth chapter. We have some verses we're going to use, but I need, I need to, I think I need to read the whole chapter just so I can get some context on what we're doing here. Is that okay? Amen. Second Corinthians, fourth chapter, starting at verse one, says this. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Verse 5 says, For what we preach is not of ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus Christ, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that this life may also be revealed in our mortal body. Verse 12, so then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. It is written, I believe, therefore I have spoken. Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. All of this is for your benefit so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes on not what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen 
is eternal. Let us pray. Dear precious God, our Father, we thank you and we praise you, God, for this time and this opportunity. We thank you, God, for allowing us to be back in your house yet one more time. Dear God, as we go into this time of teaching and understanding, dear God, I ask that you sit Arthur down, that you might stand up, dear God. So it's not I they see, dear God, but you speaking through me. Dear God, open their hearts and minds, dear God, they might receive the word that is brought forth on this morning, dear God. Help me, dear God, to not preach a good word, but dear God, help me to preach with clarity and with power, dear God, so they can loose the change, unstop the deaf ears, and, un and open the blind eyes, dear God. And God, we promise to give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 So I want to focus on just a few scriptures of there because Reverend Johnson, as I was reading this, as we often say, there's a lot of nuggets in there. But I want to back up to a little bit and I want to start back at verse 5. And I want us to focus on verses 5 through 12. And then we're going to come down through 16. Verses 5 through 12 say, For we preach not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. He says, For God who said, let, sh let the light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the, gr in the face of Christ. He says, But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Verse 6, We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus Christ so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in your body. So if I had to use for a subject this morning, I would just simply say, we're down, but not out. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I've been down, but I ain't out. Minister Robinson. Modern preachers would often say a Christian need not suffer. At least that's what some preachers might tell you. However, as I was going back and I was reading this scripture, the message of the scripture, Jesus said, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. And so that helps me to understand that, that as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus Christ, we should expect no better treatment than that of which was received by our Lord. So the question that we have to present ourselves is, when suffering comes, how do we handle it? And so as I was reading this scripture, there were some things where, where, where Paul was starting to talk to me, and he, and he says, my brother, I know you used to dream, my friend, but when did you stop? I know you used to have hope, my friend, but when did you stop? He says, I came by here today just to give you a little boost. I says, I came to reach out a hand, my brother, as a friend to pull you up because sometimes I understand that when we get down, we just need a hand to pull us up every now and then. He says, I'm not coming here to put you down, but I'm coming here to build you up. You see, because I understand every now and then all you need is a little nudge because, see, I understand how you've been wired. I understand how you have been created. I understand that every now and then life gives you some sucker punches and you've been sucker punched and you've been knocked down, but I'm here to tell you, my brother, you can still get up. You've been down, but you're not out. He says, you've been knocked down, but you're not out. And so people says, what is it? What is the definition of down? Down, downward, going in a downward direction, being in a low position or on the ground or on the bottom. But see, here's the good news about being down. You see, when you're all already on a solid foundation when you're down, you can always look up. So if you can look up, you can get up. You see, being down is only temporary. Being down does not mean you're defeated. So what Paul is saying, you may be down, but you're definitely not out. And so this is what he's saying at this particular point. Paul, as he's, as he's coming back through all the things that he was doing in this, he's writing in response to some super apostles, some people who were flamboyantly teaching the gospel and yet perverting it as the very first prosperity preachers. Paul talked about his own sufferings and he suggested that through our weakness, through our frailty, God can shine even brighter. Paul says it's not about you, but it's about the Christ that's in you. 
He says, so imagine yourself in the crowd of the first church of Corinth as Paul's letter is read. And as Paul's letter is reading, let's see if we can learn some things from what Paul is saying. And that kind of brings me to my first point. You don't have to be in the spotlight because you have the light of Christ in you. So what is Paul doing here? Paul is contrasting to true believers with those false teachers who drew attention to themselves. You see, they wanted to be in the spotlight. They wanted to stand out in front. But Paul says, it's not about you. It's about the Jesus that's in you. You see, they made it their business to preach Christ and not themselves. So the scripture says, we preach not ourselves. Self was the matter, not, nor to the end of those apostles preaching. See, they didn't give their own notions. They didn't give their own views on the things. They give you their private opinions, nor their passions or their prejudice. For the word of God was all standing true in everything that they say. You see, as they were preaching, we came to understand they didn't speak about themselves. They weren't trying to advance their own secular interest, but they preached Christ to Christ the Lord. See, it became more apparent to them as they were doing these things that they were not just servants of themselves, but they were servants to the people. Their business was to make the master known to the world as the Messiah and the Christ, as Jesus, as the only savior of men. So it was right for them to try to advance the cause of Christ and not their own cause. So the Bible says we preach not ourselves. He says we neither proclaim our own wisdom nor power. He says we have nothing but what we have received. We do not wish to establish our own authority nor procure our own emollient. You see, sometimes when you're in the spotlight, you feel the pressure to have to perform. You see, we want to be bigger. We want to be better. We want to be louder. We want to be faster. We want to be prettier. We want to be stronger. We want to be brighter. And we're tempted sometimes to toot our own horns. You see, sometimes when we talk about preachers, preachers sometimes get to the point where they want to minister in their own way and they want to minister about the things. But Paul is saying when they're preaching, has a primary reference to their own interest. And when they engage in it to advance their reputation or to secure some way their own advantage, he says when their aim is to exalt their own authority, extending their influence or in any way promoting their own welfare. He says when they proclaim their own opinions and not the gospel of Christ. He says when they derive their own doctrines, that is they come up with their own thoughts. They come up with their own ways of doing things. They come up with their own reasons, and it's not from the Bible. It says, when they put themselves forward, speak much of themselves, refer often to themselves, they are weighing in their powers of reasoning, their eloquence, and their learning, and they speak to make these things known rather than just the simple truths of the gospel. In other words, what Paul is telling us here, he says in one word, when self is primary, and the gospel is secondary, that's when they prostitute the ministry. He says, because what they're doing is they're, 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 they're trying to gain popularity. They're, they're trying to live a life of ease. They, they want to be respected. They want to boost their livelihood. They want to gain influence and rule over the people. And they, and they make the preaching of the gospel merely an occasion of advancing themselves. Such a plan is implied here as Paul is talking about it. He says it would lead to dishonest arts and devices and to trick and to, and to stratum people and to accomplish the end view. And what Paul is applying here is that we ought to avoid all such tricks. You see, the true way is not to preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ. I had a wise preacher tell me when I was first coming up, he says, the Bible don't need no help. He says, the Bible stands on its own. He says, so you ain't got to put flowers around it. You ain't got to, you ain't got to spray perfume on it. You ain't got to make it look good. He says, the Bible's going to stand on its own. He says, all you got to do is say what God said and the people's going to understand And so as Paul's going through this, he reminds us that Christ's light shines in our hearts. 
You see, the moment that we surrender to his lordship, Christ begins to shine in our hearts. Verse 6 says, says, states that the one who spoke the light into being at creation is the same one who puts the light of Christ in your hearts. You see, the moment we become a believer, God creates again. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. And this is where it gets good. He says, the old is gone and the new is here. He says, so whatever you used to be before you came in Christ ain't there no more. You're now a new creation. You don't look like what you used to look like. You don't sound like what you used to sound like. You don't walk like what you used to walk like. But as I was coming through this, I came to understand that that this image of Christ was very personal for Paul. You see, Paul became a believer when he was blinded on the road to Damascus. The Bible says the light of Christ was brighter than the noonday sun. It says, and Paul asked, who are you, Lord? See, that's an amazing thing right there. Because if you understand Paul's story, Paul was a persecutor of Christians. But Paul had enough sense in him to recognize that when God reached down and shone upon him, he knew who he was talking to at that particular moment. And the Bible says the Lord answered, I am Jesus, the one you've been persecuting. And so what does Paul do? Paul shares in detail this light. He talks about it in the New Testament. He talks about Christ blinding light, changing him forever. That's what I want to tell you quick, real quick. Says, if you ever met him, there ought to be a change. If you met the Christ that you say you know, there ought to be a change. You shouldn't be the way you used to be after you met him than you were before you met him. Some things should have changed in your life because now you don't see things the same way you used to see them. Craig Goschel said, God did not call us to blend in. He said, but he called us to stand out. He says, let your light shine. Y'all know that little song, this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. So the question is, how are you letting your light shine through you? Do you got to try harder? Do you need just to trust more? Do you need to trust that God will use you? And you, sometimes you have to understand that you got to make yourself available for his purposes. See, sometimes we don't make ourselves available to God. We treat God like God needs to make an appointment with us to do the things that he wants to do. But every now and then we sing that song, Lord, I'm available to you. So if you're available to God, that means you're available 24-7, 365 days a year. There is never a time that you're not available for God to use you for what he has. Because Philippians 2 and 13 says, it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to feel what? His good purpose. You see, it ain't about us. It's about the God that's in us. You see, that's why you don't have to be in the spotlight because you already have the light of Christ in you. Which brings me to my second point. The older you get, the more glory God gets. You see, the moment we are born, we begin to die. The aging process sets in, as just as it did for our first parents, Adam and Eve, the moment they sinned. Death and dying is a part of our sinful world. For now, at least, I should say. And that's until God makes all things anew. Yet the good news is, the weaker we are, the more glory God gets. Paul gives us this object lesson here in verse 7. He says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that his all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. So what is he saying? He says our bodies are like jars of clay. Another translation reads earthen vessels or clay pots. Amplified Bible calls it unworthy earthen vessels of human frailty. You see, as I look in the mirror and I, and I see a much different Arthur than I saw 20 years ago, although I think I'm the same person, <laughs> you look in the mirror and you're still trying to think that you was that 20-year-old person, <laughs> but you're not the same person that you are. Why? Because the mirror does not lie. The mirror is going to show you every crack, every wrinkle, every scar, every scrape, every gray hair. It's going to show it all to you. 
And so I, 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 I said, Paul, I got to go back and I got to do a little research. I got I to gotta do some research on clay pots. And, and here's what I found. There's a, there's a, there's a very well-known clay pot. It's called a terracotta play clay pot. And these are some of the most expensive clay pots just because of the way they're made. It's like a modern day clay pot because back then people used earthenware for all kinds of storage. They wanted to keep all types of things in it from scripture to human waste. And sometimes it's like the ones that we see in our households and there was a clay pot that housed the Dead Sea Scrolls. So it's kind of like our modern day Tupperware or our storage containers. But yet, like, unlike a lot of storage containers, clay pots are fragile. Clay pots are fragile because in order for the pot to be strong enough to do what it needs to do, it needs to be heated and kin dried. Now, when it becomes kin dried, it becomes a solid thing. The problem is that solid thing is susceptible to breaking if it's dropped on a hard surface. So even though something important may be stored in that clay pot, the container itself is not important. See, that's how it is with us. Our bodies house our spirit, which for believers is one day going to go back and be with Christ. As the body is going to go back to the dust where it came. What do we say? Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. That means the body's going back to where it was and our spirit's going on to be with Christ. So as, as this is what we have to understand. Too many times we get caught up with how we look. We get caught up with the natural. See, it ain't about, it ain't about all of this. It's about what's on the inside that counts. Because this is going to die and go back away. But the spirit that's on the inside is going to continue to go on to be with Christ. So the Bible tells us that we got to take care of our bodies because they house the Holy Spirit. So what are you saying? That means we ain't got to obsess over them. We're in this obsession time now where everybody wants more. They want lips. They want hair. They want breasts. They want butts. They want legs. They want all of this stuff. The pastor, I was talking to, talking to some of my minister brothers one day, and we, was, and we just happened to have been talking about that. I said, I says, you know, some of y'all ought to be scared. He's like, why? I said, because one day you're going to meet a woman. You're going to go home. She's going to come back out. She's not going to look like the same woman she was when you walked in there. You say, by the time she gets done taking off everything, you're going to be wondering who you brought home. (laughs) So what is it saying? It says you got to take care of this vessel, but you don't have to obsess over it. And so what am I doing? I'm giving you permission to not have to worry about facelifts and tummy tucks and hair transplants. Why? Because all of those things are normal. They're a normal part of the aging process. You see, as you get older, the glory of God just shines brighter in you. It's those things that God is doing in you that now makes you shine brighter than you were when you was 20. You see, because it shows that you done been through a few things. You've learned a few things. You've experienced a few things. And because you've gone through all of those things, the glory of God just now shines just that much brighter through you. And Paul points out that that in our human frailty, the power of God can shine through. Why? Because what do we have? We have that hope of Christ in our hearts. But what you need to understand, God can do in and through us more than we could ever do on our own. See, that's the the wonderful thing about God. See, too often times we think we got it all together. I got this. No, you ain't got this. Because if you got this, you wouldn't have been home crying last night. You wouldn't have been walking in here like somebody just killed your puppy. But you want people to think that you got this. And what Paul's saying, this thing is frail. 
But if you got the God in you, you don't worry about what's going on on the outside. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. So the older you get, the more you depend on God. The more you're trusting God. What are you saying? There were things you did when you was younger that you probably ain't going to do today. There was some crazy stuff we did when we was 14, 15, 20 years old that we wouldn't even think about today. Because each day we wake up and we can put our feet on the ground, we give God glory for letting us see another day. You're saying, God, thank you for waking me up this morning. I had a friend that didn't wake up this morning, God, but thank you for waking me up. Not only, God, thank you for waking me up, but I, I, I sat up in the bed, God, and I reached over and I put my foot on the carpet. Thank you, God, for letting me feel the floor below my feet. It might have been cold, but that's okay, God, because I can feel the cold. That lets me know I ain't dead yet. Thank you, God, for letting me leave the house. I might have to walk with a cane, but God, I'm still walking. I might not be able to run, God, but I can keep on going forward. The more, the more you depend on God, the more glory God gets. Which brings me to my third point. Because of the gospel, you might get down, but you're not out. The Urban Dictionary defines the phrase down but not out as resolve or stupidity. When a person has lost the upper hand in a competition or in life, but has not yet lost or quit. Right. See, well, you see it used in sports a lot. For instance, when a boxer takes a beating and he keeps on getting up. You know, on a, on a football game, because I know a lot of y'all like football, and it looks like the team is losing until they get to that last quarter, and they, they proved in the last quarter they might have been down, but they wasn't out. You see, Paul gives us some poetic couplets to illustrate this truth in his own life. You see, as Paul was going through some hard times, he says in verse 8 and 9, he says, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. One of these couplets is a play on words in the Greek. It's equivalent, it's equivalent might be, I'm, I'm struck down, but I ain't struck out. I'm at a loss, but I'm never at a loss. You see, on Paul's first missionary trip, the crowd tried to stone him to death. The word says they, they threw rocks at to him until they thought he was dead. He was down, but he wasn't out. See, after the crowd drifted away, the Bible says fellow believers helped him up and, and he moved on to talk about a rough beginning. And so I often wonder what was Paul thinking about when he wrote these words? You see, what God is, what Paul is trying to say, he says, it's not over until God says it's over. So what are you saying, preacher? Sometimes we feel weak. We feel like we're adrift. But we need to understand yet God's strength is still working in us. You see, God will keep us in the fight when we feel like we ain't got no more fight. You see, if we depend on him and not ourselves, even after some people says it's over, God says just not yet. People done counted you out, but God says, you ain't out yet. He's, God says, I'm still here and we're going to keep on getting up because my word is stronger than what they say. You see, life sometimes will shift us from one situation to the next. The next thing that we go sometimes is worse than the first thing that we're in. But what God is saying, you can try to kill me, you can try to take me down. That just means we get to go to heaven a lot earlier. You see, it's a win-win for us. You see, whether we live and we live in the power of God, God, or whether we die and we go be with God, it's a win-win. So no matter what you do, I ain't afraid. Yeah. The Bible says, greater is he who is in me than he who is in the word. 
And then we get down a little further. It says nothing will separate us from the love of God. God often says he is going to, he himself will perfect and confirm and strengthen and establish us after we have suffered. So what are you saying, Paul? What are you saying, Pastor? So first Peter puts it like this. He says, even this, being hit so hard that we're knocked to the ground is going to work together for God's good. So what are we saying? Once you remember that once we were knocked down, Jesus was knocked down. Y'all remember Jesus, right? Y'all celebrate Jesus, right? So as we're in this thing of Lent, right, we're going through the process of walking back through what Jesus went through. And the Bible says that Jesus, when he was being beaten, he says he was beaten, but he spoke not a word. It says they beat him from sun up to sundown, but he spoke not a word. They talked about him, but he spoke not a word. They accused him, but he spoke not a word. They had counted him out, but he still spoke not a word. They hung him on a cross, but he spoke not a word. They thought he was dead, but he let them know, you might have thought you buried me, but in three days, I'm getting back up again. So what Jesus is telling me, you thought I was down, but my father says, I ain't out. You see, we, 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 we live in a time of popularity when, when popularity is covered with people like to be liked, Reverend Johnson, and, and yet sometimes you have to understand that sometimes you may have to suffer for your faith. Even Paul knew that his days were numbered, but Paul didn't despair. You see, he knew that, that any suffering or any, or any death for him meant life for others. See, as they, as they embraced the gospel through his witness, verse 12 says, death is at work for in us, but life is at work in you. Yeah. So let's return to our initial thought today, which is it ain't about you. It's about God that's in us and not us. So what are you saying? What, is that, what does that mean? Colossians, Colossians 127 says this is, this is what matters. Friends are going to come and friends are going to go. Popularity may rise and fall. But yet if we follow Jesus Christ, we might be down, but we never going to be out. You see, I've heard from some of our combat veterans who are sometimes at the turning point in a war where they were going out to fight it. And they said, they said, my brother, I might not come home for this. But then they realized that the God that they serve was greater than any enemy they could face. And so that fear left them and they were able to function and to do the things that they were being sent to do. So this is what Paul said. Paul decided he only had one person to please. See, too many times we're trying to please too many people. Right? Sometimes I say it's a, it's a thing called mind over matter. People say, well, preacher, what are you saying? It's a thing called mind over matter when it comes to people. Well, what does that mean? Y'all don't mind because it don't matter. When it comes to the gospel of Christ, it's not about saying what's going what's to make people feel good. Because, see, sometimes the gospel don't feel good. Sometimes it cuts. And sometimes it's like it's ripping off that bandage and it's taking some hairs with it when it comes. But there are other times when it soothes and it feels real good. But please, under time, it all ain't always going to feel good and it ain't always going to feel bad. But the Bible is always going to balance itself. The Bible is always going to give us exactly just what we need. And so this is what Paul sums it up. He sums it up in verse 16 through 18, and he says this. He says, therefore, we do not lose heart. He says, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. And this is the part I found really important. I need y'all to write this down. Verse 17 says, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So what are you saying, preacher? This is what I'm saying. You see, my brothers and sisters, life can be tough. It can throw us curveballs that we never saw coming. It can leave us battered. It can leave us bruised. It can leave us weary. It can leave us worn. But in the midst of all, we got to remember a few things. The first thing that we got to remember is our God is faithful. Our God is steadfast. 
always unmovable. He may not always come when we want him, but we always understand that our God is always right on time. The Bible says he is our rock and our fortress. He is our, he is our savior in the times of trouble. Paul puts it this way. He says, therefore, my brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And this is where it gets real important. He says, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain. So let me break it down for you this way. Let me call Uber and Park right here. Paul the apostle knew two things about suffering. In a word, in a word this, is where, this is where the superficial reigns supreme. You see, we're here, our bodies may falter. Our circumstances might seem bleak. We are minded not to lose heart. Situations are going to come. Things are going to knock you down. But Paul reminds you, don't lose heart. People are going to walk away from you. But Paul reminds you, don't lose heart. Though outwardly you may be getting weaker, inwardly you're getting stronger. Paul says, keep going. The wear and tear of this earthly existence is going to wear on you. But Paul says, keep going. Things are going to happen in your life. But Paul says, keep going. Don't worry about the people who have left you. Paul says, keep going. Don't worry about the people plotting against you. Paul says, keep going. Don't worry about the people that scandalize you. Paul says, keep going. You're going to cry sometimes. But Paul says, keep going. You're going to hurt sometimes. Paul says, keep going. They thought you was gone. But Paul says, keep going. They thought you wasn't coming back. But Paul says, keep going. Because every time you keep going, there's a transformation that's happening in your life. There's a renewal of your spirit that happens with every circumstance that you go through. You was down yesterday, but you're up today. People don't know what you've been through. They look at you and you don't look like what you've been through. Why? Because greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. So it don't matter what I go through today. You might have thought I was down, but Paul in the Bible says, I'm not out. And these troubles that we have. The Bible says they are just a fleeting memory. What does that mean? You're going to go through it for a little while, but it's going to be all over soon. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Oh, you're hurt right now, but it's not going to last always. Trouble don't last always. You, your kids might act crazy now, but they ain't always going to act crazy. You're going to hurt a little heart right now, but it ain't always going to hurt. What you're going through right now, you you don't need to worry about because God says, I still got it. Paul wants you to understand. They're going to stab you in the back, but that's all right. They're going to scandalize your name, but that's all right. They left you for dead, but that's all right. They thought you wasn't coming back, but that's all right. The doctor said, I can't do no more, but that's all right. They said you can't have the house, but that's all right. They said your credit says you can't have the car, but that's all right. Because Paul says, I've been down. I've been crying. I've been worrying. I've been sweating. I've been snotting. I've been tearing. I've been doing all of those things. I had a pity party, brought Tupperware, served food, had drinks, invited some friends. But everybody needs to understand, I was down yesterday. But God says, get up. Put a smile on your face. Let them know that I'm still here. That no matter what they say, that the greater I am with you than anything that's going to happen on the outside. You was down, but you ain't out. And this is what he says. This is what he says. He says, he says, and after you suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. What are you saying? You suffered for a little while. I suffered yesterday, 
but I'm shouting today. I cried last night, but I'm singing this morning. I crawled last night, but I'm dancing this morning. Because the God that I serve says, though you suffered for a little while, get up, because it's over. Stop crying, because it's over. It says he will strengthen you. You was weak then, but you're strong now. They thought you didn't have it then, but you got it now. And that's why the devil gets so mad at us, because the devil can't understand that while he threw his best shot at you, you just look at him and laugh. You say, devil, you gave me your best shot, but I'm going to keep on going. Why? Because I know this ain't going to last always. I know I ain't always going to be down. I ain't always going to be crying. I ain't always going to be worrying. But there's going to come a time, devil, when I'm going to get to dance on your grave because I understand that your time is coming. The Bible, the Bible puts it this way. He says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time. That means what's going on right now. He says, I consider it. What does that mean? That means I was thinking about it. I was pondering on it. It's been swirling around in my head that the sufferings of this present time. That means my, my condition ain't my conclusion because this time is passing. It says the sufferings of this present time and this is where it gets bitty. What I'm going through now ain't worthy. It ain't worthy to be compared to the glory that God has revealed in us. So what I'm going through right now don't matter. It don't matter because God's got more for me. It don't matter because God's got greater for me. And then James says it like this. James says, count it all joy. Count it all joy when you meet trials of various kinds. That means you're going to meet some stuff that's going to knock you to the ground. He says, but you count it all joy. When I'm going through, I count it all joy. When I'm crying, I count it all joy. And this is what he says. He says, for you know. How do you know? You know because God told you so. He says, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And this is what he says. Let steadfastness have its full effect. That you may be perfect and complete. Lacking in nothing. So what is he saying? when that situation comes up on you don't move to the left don't move to the right stand right there don't move back stand right there you see that's what makes the devil nervous you see too many times when the situation comes upon us we're tempted to step back we want to sidestep it we want to go around it but what God is saying you don't have to go around it you don't have to be afraid of it just stand right there stand right there and watch what I do stand right there and watch me deal with your situation stand right there and watch me deal with your enemies stand right there and watch me deal with your healing But then as we, but then as I was going for, as I, as I went back and I looked at this, we talked about we're, we're, we're hard pressed on every side and we're, but not crushed and we're perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. I had to go all the way back to the old Testament and I, and I, and I had to find, I had to find this scripture and, 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 and this, and this scripture sent me to shout. It sent, it sent me to shout. It's, it's back in Psalms, the 37th chapter. 
Verse 25, and he, and, he, and he put it like this. He says, I've been young. And now I'm old. <laughs> I've never, never, not when I was young, <laughs> not now that I'm old, <laughs> not anywhere in the middle. <laughs> he says, I've never. <laughs> I've never seen. That means I ain't never seen it. It don't mean it didn't happen. But because I'm a child of God, at least I ain't never seen it. At least I ain't never had to put my eyes on it. He says, I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed in bread. What does that mean? That means it ain't about me. It's about the Christ that's in me. Jesus on the cross said, God, why have you forsaken me? God says, because it ain't about you. It's about me. He says, well, even though you think I'm not there, I'm still right there next to you. Even though you think I've left you, I'm still right there next to you. Even though you think you're by yourself, I'm still right there with you. So it don't matter what you go through. The Bible says, yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because thou art with me. He says, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. I'm going through, but it's all right. I'm feeling pain, but it's all right. I'm down, but it's all right. Because I know that my God is standing right there next to me, saying, just hold on, Arthur. Keep on going. I got you, bro. Don't worry about this. It's going to hurt for a little while, but it's going to be all right. It's going to sting for a minute, but it's going to be all right. I know this don't feel good, but it's going to be all right. Let us shift. For every tear, every obstacle faced, every pain endured, my brothers and sisters, they are not in vain. They're working for us a far, far greater reward, an eternal reward that surpasses all your wildest imaginations. And since what he's, what he's saying is you're going to go through some stuff, but what's waiting for you on the other side is far greater than anything you could ever imagine. So just keep holding on. We need to fix our eyes, my brothers and sisters. Not on the fleeing circumstances of this world. But we got to fix our eyes on those unseen things that God has for us. He says, for the things that are seen are what? They're temporal. They're temporary. But those things that's not seen, that's eternal. That's eternal. I got some application for you. Life is filled with some unexpected challenges, setbacks, trials. A lot of that stuff can leave us feeling discouraged and defeated. Embracing resilience in the vastery means that we're recognizing that while we may get knocked down by life's challenges, we're never truly defeated as long as we maintain our courage, our faith, our perseverance to rise again. So how do we do that? We have to cultivate a positive mindset. We gotta draw strength from our faith. We got to practice self-care. Too many times we spend our time worrying about what somebody else thinks. Right? Their opinion has no, has no impact on God's will for your life. And then most of all, we got to learn from our setbacks. Because your setbacks helps you strengthen your faith. Everything ain't always going to work out. Everything ain't always going to be the way we thought it was supposed to be. Every now and then, something's going to go wrong. But when you do that, you got to learn to stay persistent. And most of all, you got to persevere. 
Because if you truly believe that your God is always with you, there is nothing, nothing that you can't go through. As we're standing, Nobody ever said that the life of a Christian would ever be an easy one. And it's not. See, because the devil's always busy. He's always busy. He works 24-7, 365, and he's always recruiting. Right? That's why I always tell people, says, you know, a lot of times we always got to check our faith. Right? Because the devil don't mess with those he already got. So if you're going through some stuff, it might be because he sees you as a threat. He sees you as, 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 as something that he can't get a hold of. And so his whole job is to make you as miserable as possible. To throw as much stuff on you in hopes that you quit. That you say, God, I can't do this no more. Because he wants you to believe that, that your God ain't there with you. That's what he wants. And so when he gets you to believe that, now he thinks he got you. But we know greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. And so here at this body of Zion, we don't offer you any sure fixes to life. What we do offer you is a pathway to understand the God that we serve. To know that the stuff that you've gone through, there's somebody in this building that's been through pretty much everything you're going through. They done been through it, got the scars, got the t-shirts to show it. And they still here. And so that should give you solace to know if he did it for them, and I get to know him, I'm quite sure he's going to do the same thing for me. Now we know there's always three types of people that come to church. First person says, Dr. Wright, I don't know God. I want to get to know him. We offer you the opportunity to, to if you wish, join this body in Zion. Come, get to know him. Trust you, my God is awesome. Okay? My God is awesome. Tyson in his best days can't beat my God. <laughs> and so we give you that opportunity. If you don't want to step out right now, that's okay. You can just raise your hand. Our altar workers will be here to work with you. There'll be somebody here to the right of the stage. They'll be able to work with you and walk you through that process. Second person says, God, I was there, but I done kind of drifted away. I let things and circumstances and situations separate me from my God. And what we're saying is you're welcome to come back. Bust your hand, give God your heart and says, God, I, I, I was away for a while, but I trust you, God. I know that you can do it. I had some doubts, but God, I still want to work those things out. We welcome you. The altar is always open. Third person says, God, I just need some prayer. It's been rough. I've been going through a lot. Some days I don't know if I'm going to make it. Some days I don't know how I'm going to make it. It seems like every day just gives me new problems. And what we're saying is, what we're saying is God is always here. His body's here to pray with you and for you that God will continue to strengthen you and keep you. We don't say it's going to be easy, but it's always a lot easier when you're not going through it by yourself. So if you just want to come and pray, the altar's open.
Now y'all know me. When I pray, it ain't ever about us. <clears throat> Look around. We some blessed people. But there's somebody who, as I, as I say in my, um, in, my, in my Baltimorean vernacular, who ain't got what we got. <laughs> right? And as intercessors, we should always pray for those. We should always stand in the gap for those who don't know the words of prayer. Somebody's on there. On the bed this morning, tubes are breathing for them. And the machine is pumping their heart for them. And is doing everything for them. And they don't even know they're in the world. And then somebody said, God, I really wanted to be here this morning. But the devil threw everything he could at me this morning to make sure I couldn't get here. And we let them know that we're still praying for you. So let us pray. Must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? There's a cross for everyone. There's a cross for me. God, we come this morning, bowed heads, humbled hearts, as empty vessels before a full fountain, God. Just saying thank you, God. Thank you for this opportunity to, to be here. Thank you, God, for allowing us, dear God, to hear your preached word, to sing your songs, dear God, to offer praise unto you, dear God. Thank you, dear God, for giving us an opportunity that wasn't promised to us. But dear God, this morning, God, it's not about us. Dear God, we come to this morning, dear God, just to stand in the gap, dear God, because we know, dear God, that there's somebody right now, dear God, who's wandering the streets, dear God, that, that, that has lost hope, dear God. There's, they're, they're wandering the street, God. They're not sure how they're going to make it, dear God. There's, there's a mother, dear God, that's sitting at a table right now crying, trying to figure out how she's going to feed her children, dear God. There's somebody trying to figure out how they're going to make ends meet, dear God. There's somebody, dear God, that's lost a job, dear God. There's somebody, dear God, that's got a bad report from the doctor dear God. There's somebody, dear God, that's, that's facing all kinds of trials and situations, dear God. Their family ain't acting right, God. Their job ain't acting right, dear God. Dear God, we're coming to you this morning, dear God, to offer a prayer, dear God, for them. So, God, that you might let them know, dear God, that all they might think all is lost, dear God, that all isn't lost, dear God, because you're still on the throne and that nothing happens unless you say it to be so. So, God, we're asking, dear God, that you just continue to move in that situation right now, God. You know all about them, dear God, because you're an all-knowing God. And nothing happens, dear God, unless you say it to be so. Your Bible says, dear God, that, that while we were still yet sinners, your son died for us. God, we know, dear God, that there are some, dear God, who, who still may not know you right now, dear God. We ask that you just prick their heart, dear God, because we know that it's you that draws. Let it draw them closer to you, dear God. Let it bring them in, dear God. To let you know, dear God, that, 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 that as they go through this walk, that you'll never leave them nor forsake them. That no matter what they go through, God, you're always going to be right there. And so, dear God, as we offer up these prayers, dear God, we don't count these as things that are going to be done, dear God. We count them as already done, dear God. We offer a prayer, dear God, for my sister that came this morning, dear God. You know about her situation, dear God. We ask that you just continue to move, dear God. Because you got it all, dear God. Let her know, dear God, that she's not by herself. That we're right here with her, dear God. Because we know there's numbers, dear God, in the strength of the faithful. And so, dear God, as we degree depart from this place, but not from your sight, dear God. We ask that God as we return to our various homes, dear God, that we not find them as they were, dear God, but we find them better than they were when we left, dear God. That whatever situation we may have left, dear God, that you have already worked it out, that you've already delivered it, dear God. Continue, dear God, to bless this great body in Zion, dear God. Bless the leader and the shepherd, dear God, that you have placed over your people. And God, we promise to give you all glory, all honor, and all God's power. And so, God, we do this in the name of your precious son, Jesus Christ, who hung, bled, died, and rose on the third day with all power in his hand. In your precious name, 
we say amen. amen. Ah.